you very much for inviting me, Kat. Uh, it's, a, it's a great pleasure to be there with you tonight. Um, so my name is Dr. Anke Bruning Richardson, and I'm from the University of Huddersfield. And tonight I will be talking to you about my work in, in brain tumor research, and I'm trying to replace preclinical in vivo studies um, with in vitro models that we use um, routinely now in the lab. So before I start about my research, just a little bit about Huddersfield for those of you who don't know about Huddersfield. So Huddersfield is a town in the north of England in Yorkshire. It was a very prosperous town for a while due to the textile industry. And you can see there are these very nice prominent mills and buildings we still have and also a um, very nice railway station. But um, recently, I guess the most prominent um, sort of employer in the region is the University of um, Huddersfield. I was thinking about Huddersfield as well in terms of celebrities or famous people and um, was really uh, astounded to find that this gentleman here, some of you might recognize him, James Mason, is actually from Huddersfield. He's not American. I thought he was. And we also have Harold Wilson, who was a Labour Prime Minister and who actually introduced the concept of the Open University. So people studying um, from afar um, to, to become um, uh, an academic or or lecturer or you know wherever your your particular path would take you up. However, I think the most most celebrated celebrity is this chap here. Um, this is actually the station cat Felix. She has got um, followers all over the world. I have now managed to to meet her twice in my time at Huddersfield, which is quite surprising. But going to the University of Huddersfield itself. And we were established in 1825. We are a smallish university, but we do have around 20,000 um, students, both at um, undergraduate and postgraduate level. Um, and we offer a range of courses, you know, from business studies to the arts and obviously the applied sciences. We have been named University of the Year in 2013, and we are quite international, as you can see here. We have students from over 130 countries. And in terms of our output in research, we actually have been placed in the top third of all UK institutions on the measurement of research power. So apart from our teaching obligations, we are actually really um, research active as well, which is great um, that we have time in the lab to do some work. And then just to point out, we have some prominent uh, chancellors as well amongst the ranks. So this is a local boy. You will recognize him, Sir Patrick Stewart, who unfortunately is not a chancellor anymore. So I just missed him. But we do have um, so interactions with people of celebrity status, I guess, um, So which makes us very proud. So coming, though, now to my research. So I am int um, interested in brain tumors or glioblastomas, GBM. And these are a type of brain tumor that are very aggressive, highly aggressive, um, um, very invasive brain cancer. You can see here in the image of the, um, the, the sample or specimen from the patient. And you can see here as well that the medium survival rate is very low. This is very, very low for cancer. And this is following surgery, chemotherapy and radiotherapy. So mostly these patients are diagnosed quite late. Um, then they are given surgery as you see, chemotherapy and radiotherapy, but within 15 months or so, the tumors will recur. And when that happens, we cannot do anything for the patients and the patients will die. So a very aggressive type of tumor. And uh, unfortunately, even though we have investigated this tumor type now for some time, um, not many advances have been made in the field of um, brain tumor research. Treatment is very difficult um, because of the blood-brain barrier, for example. We have to get um, treatments across into the brain, and there's only one kind of drug that we use um, currently, which is temozolomide. Um, obviously, we also are targeting the brain with radiation therapy, not very good for the surrounding healthy tissue. So a lot of complications associated with that. And as you can imagine, and this is what part of this talk is about, is there is um, current research that often involves intracranial implantation of tumors in mice or rats. And that's um, obviously something we would like to sort of see replaced or at least reduced. So there is the question, as in other cancer types and other cancer research, in vivo versus in vitro in, in GBM research. So what are the advantages or potentially disadvantages of in vivo and or in vitro? And to go back to some figures here um, relating to animal work, um, I just pulled these figures out from the ICR in London that, that sort of published their, their cancer research and the animals they use, the numbers. And you can see here that um, within 12 years or so, they actually have 
reduce the numbers of animals they use, especially mice, but there are also some rats, but they still seem very quite high. And how does that relate to um, brain tumor research? So I had a little look around and it's quite difficult to find um, any kind of direct information. However, this is um, um, a quote I found by David Dickens who had been awarded a, um, a grant by the NC3Rs. And he reckoned that there are approximately 4,500 rodents a year that are used for GBM xenograft experiments in the UK. And uh, he also made a little um, a sort of um, exploration of the literature and he found that worldwide um, there are animals used for GBM xenografts um, and these are particularly rodents and, and from this um, research that he carried out he reckons there are around at least 60,000 rodents a year for GBM xenograft studies. And this particular researcher was interested in, in establishing in vitro models of the blood brain barrier and um, uh, he sort of said that supportive of this, we, we are looking at potentially um, an estimated 20% reduction in animal work. And obviously that would lead then to around 12,000 animals that uh, could be spared. So this is the kind of figures we are looking at here. So I think we can really improve um, in this field um, in, in terms of preclinical in vitro models. And as you can see here, the home office actually has graded this as severity a moderate. And this is again, um, obviously involving procedures uh, where the animals are likely to experience short-term moderate pain, suffering or distress, or long-lasting mild pain, suffering or distress. Um, so I think we can really um, do something to, to promote in vitro models in this field to, to get the numbers down of the animals that are being used. So what are the current in vivo models in GBM research? So as, as this is involving the brain, so you can see that there are different models that have been taken forward. Uh, so first of all, we have the, um, the, the cell line xenograft, where we um, normally have um, cancer cells in the lab that are established human tumor cell lines. They are cultured and they're then transplanted or intracranially injected into mice. And these mice are actually immunocompromised, which means they haven't got an immune response to these cells so that they can actually take. Um, then there are the patient-derived xenografts where we actually take tissues from, from patients or primary tumors and, and um, prepare them in, in tissue culturing to also be transplanted into mice. So these, these are immunocompetent mice. And we have um, syngenic uh, models, which means that we actually have also established mouse tumor cell lines that we can culture and inject into mice. And of course, most recently, um, there are the genetically engineered mouse models um, where we can um, produce particular mouse lines that we use for our studies. But what are the um, advantages and disadvantages? So I think it's very clear in, in terms of disadvantages with the genetically engineered mouse models is that, that we can only uh, select a few genes that we can alter. And, and that really does not reflect the genetic heterogeneity that we see in these tumors. And if you look at these high-grade tumors, they are composed of different cellular um, subpopulations. Each tumor is different from each other, from patient to patient. So really, um, I don't think that is very reflective of that. Um, the xenograft um, mouse models that we see, they do not reflect the challenge by the immune environment. As we heard, uh, um, animals are immunocompromised and therefore they don't have an immune response. But we know now from uh, most recent studies that actually there is a very close interaction between the immune response and the immune system in the brain and, and the brain tumors, which is absolutely lacking here. And also in terms of um, engrafting patient-derived uh, cell lines, again, um, there are drawbacks in the sense that um, these cells not necessarily take so well or take a very long to develop, a long time to develop. And, and it, it's really kind of tricky to establish these cell lines in animals. And finally, there is also talk of humanized xenograft mouse models where we actually add human immune systems to actually create this human sort of immune environment. But the drawbacks are it's really not economically viable. It can be very expensive and time consuming. So there is a lot of um, sort of... Um, yeah, evidence that maybe these kind of models are not as good as we wish them to be. Interestingly, as well as for other cancer studies, and not that many um, sort of findings from these studies come to fruition and um, when, when they go into clinical trial. And I think it's about the number 8% of actually all the um, um, sort of studies done from in vivo translates sort of in, in, into the clinic in the end.
What about current um, in vitro models? So I said traditional here in part, because um, as you all know, we, we do use cells in the lab and mainly what we started off as would be a monolayer cell culture. So that means we take um, cells from, from um, brain tumor patients, adapt them in cell culture and then use them in a flask. So you've got a monolayer of cells. So the, uh, these are 2D um, cultures that, that you can then propagate and use. So, but Again, these do not reflect genetic heterogeneity of our brain tumors um, and, and their cells that they're composed of, uh, as you can imagine. Also, uh, these are not 3D structures. Uh, a, a brain tumor is a 3D structure. A monolayer is a 2D um, a structure. How can we compare the two to, um, against each other? So there is also the neurotumosphere culture where we actually take um, uh, samples from, from patients and adapt them again into into um, cell culture, and here they will maybe sort of already um, readily make spheroids or spheres themselves, or we can actually adapt them to this, and that's fine. But what is missing here is to really represent the uh, brain microenvironment and the tumor environment is that, that we are lacking all these surrounding um, tissues that are there to support a brain tumor, the interactions with the normal brain environment. So this is not here, but if we're just handling these cells on their own. Again, we can then make cerebral organoids, so making actually little structures from these cells, um, um, or we can actually induce these from normal cells um, by manipulation or genetic manipulation. But we are lacking, again, the brain microenvironment, the interactions with the immune response, the actual interactions with the vascul vasculature, for example. So it's not yet representative. And we have another sort of uh, particular method we can use, which is called the organotypic brain slice culture, where you, for example, uh, use main mouse brain slices in culture. Um, they will be maintained for a while and into which you can then add your, your cells, your, your brain tumor cells or spheroids and so on. Um, so that might be okay, but you're still using animals here and it's actually not suited for long-term studies. So we cannot do sort of long running studies in these um, scenarios. Um, it's, it's not very easy to maintain. So you can see our, our problems we have with both system. And, and obviously we need to look more into sort of advancements in that field. So that's where we come to the next generation of GBM modeling in vitro and ex vivo. And we actually have some great advances now with the 3D cell organite cultures or with our high throughput imaging and data analysis that goes along with these scenarios and, and setups. And we also have improved in, in quite dramatically, I think, applications um, where we going to be looking in particular in my talk at microfluidics and ex vivo models, which hopefully help circumvent these, these uh, models that are established in, in mice. So what's happening with 3D cell organite cultures? So I think the greatest or one of the greatest discoveries um, for brain tumor research was that we could actually identify glioma stem cells. In, in, in samples from patients. So we have a particular subpopulation of cells within a tumor that are the drivers of resistance to, to treatment, that are the drivers of recurrence of tumors. And these are maintained within this population of, of, of cancer cells that you obtain from, from patient tissue. But we now have ways to actually isolate these cells and maintain them in, in a culture system which allows them to, to retain their um, stem cell like characteristics. So we can actually use these cells now efficiently to analyze um, um, yeah, features, um, uh, particular characteristics of the tumor where they originated from, which we couldn't before, because if you take cell um, cultures or if you take cell lines and put them into culture conditions, they become differentiated and are not representative anymore of the original tumors. But here we now have developed systems where we can maintain them on their kind of original state and therefore they are much, much easier to use and it's, it's obviously much more of clinical relevance to use these cells. And these cells obviously have been used now uh, following on um, from the discovery that we can maintain them and we can now create with these cells multicellular cultures in 3D. And we also make use of pluripotent stem cells, which are basically adult cells reprogrammed artificially. And 
And in this particular study here, um, there were um, these pluripotent stem cells, um, which uh, were um, able to differentiate into neurons, glial cells, and astrocytes. And they were combined with the GBM cells that I've just mentioned before to form spheroids. And by doing that, we're getting now a system where we actually have the interaction with some parts of the microenvironment of the original tumors um, and the tumor cells themselves. And, and these are very nice models that we can now use for um, the, um, for example, development of new drugs or for, for um, investigating the response to radiotherapy, etc. And that all can then take place in a platform. And you can see so here that this particular group has used a 96 well plate where they can add this uh, multicellular culture in 3D and um, uh, sort of interrogate these spheroids um, and or this particular scenario in terms of um, drug development or, or you know um, responses to radiotherapy etc and, and get some very very nice useful information out of these particular um, multicellular cultures. Um, alongside the discovery of the stem cells that I just mentioned um, we were also now able and um, to actually generate cerebral organoids. So we, we were able to use these human pluripotent stem cells I've just mentioned to actually recreate, recreate some, well, you wouldn't call it, call it a brain, but parts of the brain. So we can actually induce the formation of brain-like tissues, which are obviously very, very important if we want to investigate the interaction between these normal tissues and, and some tumors. And as you can see here, this, this paper very nicely demonstrates how we can, can develop these or generate these cerebral organoids, again, straight from, from, from humans rather than from animals and use them. And they can be used in, in several ways. For example, here we can actually induce tumor formation in these by just genetic manipulation and gene mutations, etc. And when you look at these um, organoids or these cerebral organoids, we can actually compare them to um, uh, tumors that have been formed originally. And we can see that these tumors induced in these cerebral organoids um, are very similar to, to what we would see in tumors in, in patients. So that is really exciting. And here, obviously, is an opportunity to investigate tumor development and then tumor evolution. And again, something that we can then use to test a potential drugs on or you know, potential novel treatment options. And alongside this, um, as you can imagine, we then had also the development of GBM organoids. So not the cerebral organoids that um, recreate the normal tissue, but also organoids and derived from uh, GBM cells from patient samples. And what we do here is in this particular example is that, um, again, there is fresh GBM tumor tissue available. And these are then micro dissected into small pieces and then they're cultured um, as tumor pieces in culture, maintaining their stemless like features. And these can then be propagated and banked. So um, they're obviously accessible to other research groups or something to go back to, to, to um, re, um, visit. But, but these organoids that are generated um, are very similar architecturally and, and in other ways molecularly to their original tumor. So this is directly taken from the patient and directly used rather than having to go via an animal. And obviously these organoids are very interesting um, to investigate and, you know, in terms of drug development, drug screens, high through um, put systems um, that we, we would want to see in the development of new treatments for these patients. And finally, um, this glyco um, model was um, recently sort of proposed by a, a research group here by by, by Red et al, where we're actually combining the two. We're taking our cerebral organoids that are generated and also our GBM organoids, and we let them interact with each other. And obviously, by doing so, we are recreating this kind of micro environment, this um, um, sort of communication between two, if you want to call it that way, um, allowing these uh, two different um, uh, 
very distinct organoids to interact with each other and therefore um, recreating what is really happening in the brain. And by doing so, we can, we can use these for in retro doc screens as, as before. Um, I think that is sort of the main focus in, in these kind of large scale studies to see how we can improve on our treatment options for the patients. So I, th I think you can see how this is really exciting and what the opportunities are there for these patient-derived tissues or patient-derived samples um, that are really focusing on the human side of, of the tissue rather than using a tissue that comes from an animal that might not be so, so relevant for, for human tumors. And finally, there have been some really nice papers based around these, these um, glyco studies, where it has been shown that actually they are quite representative of, of what's happening in, in, the, in the brain environment and in, in the interaction between the brain, the normal brain environment and the tumors that, you, that reside within them. And I, I really urge you to maybe have a look at these papers um, that are indicated here, because it is quite nicely illustrated that, that we are now getting models that are of clear relevance to, to the original um, tumors and the microenvironments they're finding themselves in. But of course, like around this as well, um, are um, challenges. So um, what are our challenges? We still have to think about the genetic, genetic aberrations we find in our tumors. As we just discussed, um, the tumor microenvironments themselves, the, the, the heterogeneity within the tumors, between tumors, our um, stem cell plasticity, the invasive nature of these uh, cells. What about the immune response? We haven't sort of um, mentioned that before. How do we integrate the immune response into these models? How do we make them more relevant? The, the stromal and vascular structure, we know that obviously cells, the brain tumor cells need the vasculature, for example, to invade and to escape from the original tumors. And of course, they also um, follow by many biomechanical cues. We know that from uh, previous studies in, into brain tumors. So these are all the things that we really have to address to, to buy, to actually build up a, a, a multi-layered uh, model that we can efficiently use. But then the applications are, are manifold, of course, as we just heard, drug screening is the big thing here because we're so limited with treatment options for these patients. So anything we can use to, to actually um, screen a, a large scale sort of range of, of potential drugs on is, is fantastic. High throughput is also very important. Obviously, we want a system by which we can um, go through a lot of um, screening or a lot of samples that we have um, quickly, efficiently, um, so that we can actually get these results very quickly back to, to patients, to clinicians, to researchers, to make informed decisions. Um, Biobanking, this is another sort of I think part of this research that is so important that we have now biobanks available all over the world, researchers working on these um, tumors or tumor types that we have access to their samples that maybe if we are developing our own in vitro system, we can validate these uh, using these um, biobanks. And of course, from a pa patient point of view, personalized medicine is the, I think the way forward. We know that each tumor is so different from each patient. We cannot just apply one general treatment to all. We need to have a much more personalized approach. And obviously this is the way forward. If we are um, receiving patient samples, patient tissues from individual patients, surely it makes sense that then therefore we can build around these samples to, to maybe give these patients a better chance of survival, at least a prolonged survival. So with the applications, I think what is really exciting is this technology called microfluidics. And it's really what it says in the title. It's, it's, it's some kind of um, setup where we're using um, very minute amounts of fluids that are pumped around in the system. So in channels. Um, and within these channel systems, we can then embed or, or sort of incorporate our tissue or our um, spheroids or, or cells that we're looking at um, so that they're kind of usually embedded or, or sort of attached to a chip, which is located within this microfluidus setup. And then it's exposed to a constant stream of fluids that is kind of pumped around. And this is very important because obviously that is also what's happening in the brain, which we hadn't sort of discussed before with the other kind of static systems that we talked about just now. But here we actually have this constant flow 
and um, we, we can then expose our cells or our tumor spheroids or our tissues to any kind of condition that we want to expose them to, be it a, a certain drug treatment or maybe a certain oxygen tension, or we want to look how they respond to um, radiation therapy. This is all possible. But the other nice thing about this technology is that it is really um, low cost because your, your cost of or consumption of radiation is low. Um, your, your initial setup is very low um, and uh, you can actually approach um, and you kind of question that you have quite confidently in this sort of setup. So if this is called like a lap on a chip. You might have heard about this. And indeed, um, it is quite straightforward in a sense um, how to approach this method. So first of all, you would have to have, if you have clinical specimens, um, some kind of cell isolation. And then you would have to be able to, to prepare these um, cells or your, your specimen to, to be added onto this chip. Um, or you can use, use the 3D cell culture that you prepared beforehand. But once you've, you've got the setup, then you can look at certain conditions or, or you know, um, biological questions you're interested in. For example, cell-to-cell -cell interactions or the interactions with the extracellular matrix or with its microenvironment. As you can see here, we can look at gradients of spatial temporal or physical chemical types. Um, we can look at um, hydrodynamic microenvironments. And obviously, we can here make real-time observations. The other good thing is that you can actually collect the effluent from this whole system. So so whatever is secreted by the cells or spheroids into the um, into the fluids, we can collect and also analyze. So we've got another additional layer of sample analysis and data generation um, in, in, in this mix, in this microfluidic mix. So I'm, I'm very quite keen on this technology. Actually, I would like to try that out next. Um, and as I mentioned before, this is very cost efficient, customizable and reproducible. And here are just some examples that I found in the literature where these have been applied. Um, of course, the first thing that, that springs to mind again is, is to study drug responses. And you can see here that there is a brain cancer chip that had been en engineered for, for such a purpose, so for high throughput drug screening. And I hope you, you obviously get afterwards, after this um, um, a talk, the, the sort of script of this talk, so you can actually look up these um, particular um, references if, if you are like to, to follow this up further. What we also can study is the GBM perivas perivascular niche. As we mentioned before, there is an interaction between the tumors and the vasculature. And we also believe that um, brain tumor cells will um, uh, sort of travel along um, vessel blood vessels um, to, you know, uh, as a sort of external cue and to get away from original tumors. And obviously, this is also a perfect, perfect setup to sort of mimic these um, conditions within a tumor in these microfluidic devices. And again, there's another um, paper here that has been published where the researchers doing us just that. Blood-brain barrier, we just discussed that further um, um, in, in a sense that we, we really need to know much more about the blood-brain barrier and to overcome this to actually get um, drugs to the patient, to the, to the tumor itself. And microfluidics have been engineered to do just that. So we have an artificial um, blood-brain barrier onto which we can then, um, again, um, add certain drugs and see how permeable they are and whether they would cross the blood-brain barrier and making it much more clinically relevant. And finally, this is um, a paper by John Greenman um, from the University of Hull. And I really like this because here he's looking at actually as ex vivo maintenance of, of tissues. So, so what they have done is they've developed this microfluidic device where we can take samples from patients, tissue samples, and they are, um, again, um, added to like a chip and, and maintained within sort of two layers of, of these um, sort of carriers, um, injected into this microfluidic device, and obviously then objected to, to this um, constant flow of nutrients. And in this sort of scenario, they maintained this tissue for 72 hours. So this was still viable. Um, it had not lost um, any kind of yeah, viability in, in, the, in the 72 hours that they were looking at. And therefore, you can use these um, samples directly, so to speak, from the patients to, to look at, again, 
responses to drugs, re re potentially to um, responses to um, radiation therapy, etc. So I, I really like this paper as well. And I urge you to have a look at that. Um, and again, I, I do like this system very much and would like to incorporate in my work, which I'm going to be talking about in a minute. And finally, very kindly, some colleagues of mine from the University of Sheffield actually are sharing this, this news development in their, their research. And here you can see it's this ex vivo drug screening. And this is by Greg Wells and colleagues. And they were really interested in getting samples directly from the patient onto a screening device or some kind of screening methodology so that they would get answers straight away of maybe how to approach the particular treatment of patients. And as you can imagine, um, for patient samples, they're actually different types of samples we could potentially use. We know we can use tissues and biopsies, but don't forget there are also fluids one could use, um, um, including these ascites or peripheral blood samples and circulating tumor cells. And of course, there are ex, ex vivo techniques that we touched upon, these patient-derived cell lines and the, the cultures or organoids, etc. cetera. But, but that might take time and that will, you know, to establish these and then maybe to get some answers to your questions back to the patient. So, so what um, my colleagues in Sheffield are suggesting is that maybe we should um, be able to, to look at drug action at the single level using a live biopsy. So that means that we're getting at surgery um, or, or after biopsy fresh samples from a patient that we can directly screen in, in a, a very elaborate drug screen that um, um, my colleagues have set up and you get um, through a readout straight away um, some um, sort of prediction of responses to certain drug combinations. So we obviously have our standard of care drug um, in, in the case of gliomas, it's the temozolomide. But then in addition, we can straight away look at combination with other drugs that might be useful in targeting a particular uh, tumor in a particular patient. And I really like this idea because that means you are taking a sample straight away from a patient and use it and get a result back. Apparently, you can get the, the result back within, I think, 24 hours or so. Um, um, excuse me if I'm wrong, if, if my colleagues are here, but I, I, I thought I had that figure in mind. So and I think the way they're seeing this whole um, sort of pathway working is that you have this ex vivo drug screen pathway where we have informed consent from a patient um, and they allow you to take um, samples from a biopsy or a surgical sample, this will be immediately taken and prepared. Um, so these cells will be dissociated. And these are fresh surgical tissues. And, and they're then added to this screening platform where we have a combination of, of drugs and also in combination with the standard of care drug tomozolomide. And um, they are then viewed and the results are analyzed in terms of um, viability of cells or the effect on, on, on cell death. And um, obviously, be getting our resu results back more or less straight away. And these can then um, be taken um, in combination with um, the clinical follow-up of, of the patient and what's happening to the, the patient. And what's happening here is that we, we do look at new effective therapeutics because we will be able to, to see what combinations would be working well in this particular patient. And, and what I like as well is that it looks sort of to, to run alongside the patient clinical pathway where we have obviously the decision making with the clinicians um, and uh, then a, a diagnosis and then a treatment, treatment plan. But alongside this, um, especially in terms of follow up patient clinical response, we can get this um, data from this um, screen pathway, which hopefully advance um, the, the treatment of a, a, a patient and also makes it much more personalized. And I really like this idea. And as you can see here, we are using human fresh samples rather than going through any other sort of scenario. So the aims are then to um, still clinically validate ex vivo screening. So I think this is still ongoing. And then obviously in the long term um, to develop this as a predictive cancer test and also to use that as a preclinical drug development tool. And I think this is great because you can see here the benefits that it will um, allow the selection of appropriate drugs or drug combinations for patients, maybe the identification of um, new drugs that would be beneficial to this particular um, patient. And the um, analysis is done by AI, so if there is no kind of um, researcher bias or, or, or you know somebody who's handling all the samples. And, and you get also um, 
um, these um, outputs where we can look at response score and likelihood of response. So I think this is a really great for, um, way forward. And I hope, you know, this is continuing. And I wish uh, my colleagues all the best. And I would like to thank them at this point because they have been giving me some really great samples that I can use for my own studies. And I think we're going to continue on along those lines. Now, coming to all my own work. Um, as we just heard, I work on glioblastoma. And here's just a recap for you to see how, how devastating this disease is. Um, especially down in the bottom, I think that that scan really brings back how quickly these very aggressive glioblastoma um, grow. So you can see within 68 days um, after the first sort of initial uh, scan, this, this tumor has grown quite um, dramatically. And unfortunately, these high grade aggressive tumors are um, taking over as um, you know, the, the most prominent tumors within other um, glioma, um, brain tumor types. Um, as we just heard, there is no um, real treatment. If you don't treat at all, um, the median survivor is between three to four months. But if you have your combination therapy with surgery, chemotherapy and radiotherapy, it's 15 months. And as I mentioned before, these tumors will recur. And when they recur, there is um, no more treatment options really for these patients. So to my mind, um, I think, well, what can I do to help these patients? Um, how can we go differently? And to my mind, if, if the recurrence of a tumor is, is the reason why patients die, well, maybe we should really look at uh, this infiltrative invasive nature of these tumors. Uh, how do they migrate? How can we target this? So my vision is to have some drugs um, that, that target this migratory ability of the tumors, which we can then use in combination with these cytotoxic drugs, um, temozolomide or any other drug that hopefully will be discovered. And uh, so I see it as a, a combination or complementary treatment, because the idea is once um, a, a patient has their surgery and the, the main bulk of the tumor is removed, at that time, can we add a drug that will actually um, immobilize any remaining cancer cells that are still sort of close to the surgical wound um, and then, potentiate the treatment with cytotoxic drugs or with radiation therapy because the cells are mobilized we know where they are by the scans and we can then effectively target them with the conventional treatment so that is my kind of thinking behind this um so what are the challenges here for me um we know um that the high capacity for this migration and invasion, as you just heard, along blood vessels um, is there. Um, and we also know that these cells, um, the cancer cells, travel along neuronal tracts. And by doing so, they will um, be able to avoid detection. Um, so obviously, you have single cells migrating away. They will not be easily traced by any kind of scans. They will also avoid surgical removal. And also, they, they can all get away from drug treatments. So, so um, that is our, our challenges that we have. Um, and I also think that the existing models that we have, um, they may not be truly representative of, of drug responses in vivo. So we have to think about all this when I want to actually come up with a, a way of, of looking at migration or targeting cell migration that um, has all this in mind, but that also recapitulates um, the, the tumor environment and the tumor itself that that, that we are sort of faced with. So going back to cell migration then, um, you really need to know about cell migration, what is actually um, a driver or what key plays in cell migration. And um, there are three major components in the cell that actually allow a, a cell to, to migrate and to move. And I think you should probably all heard about these. So there are the microtubules, which actually give a, a cell an orientation. So it's actually got a direction to go. Um, the actin filament will actually relay the power that within the cell to, to give the, the cell the, the, so to speak, the drive to, to move. And then we have what we call the traction, which are the focal adhesions, um, which are contact points here on my comic or cartoon. You see these little dots on the side on the line of the cell um, that will allow um, the uh, attachment and detachment of the cell in its environment. And I, I hope you can see in this really nice immunofluorescence image here, that's a glioma cell. And I've highlighted here with different dyes the, the components. The red here are the microtubules and the green is this very enriched um, actin um, sort of filament that's especially pronounced towards the, the front of the cell 
And uh, I think you can see how elaborate actually the, the makeup of these cells is to allow them to, to migrate. So we have used certain drugs that we have observed to have um, what we call anti-migratory activity. And one of these drugs actually derived from the plant is called um, indorubin. And we have a derivative of this indorubin called bioindorubin. And when we use that in our, um, first of all, in our cancer cells that we have in the lab, we realize this um, targets very efficiently cell migration. And of course, it has to be something in the cell that is the target for a drug. And in our case, we know it's an enzyme called GSK3. Uh, glycogen synthase kinase 3. Now, this is an en enzyme that is overexpressed in brain tumor cells, and it has several functions. And lo and behold, it has also a function in cell migration. And this is from a very nice review I found, and where you can see how GSK3 actually orchestrates cell migration by um, having a direct effect on um, the actin polymerization, on microtubule um, dynamics, and also on um, um, the assembly and disassembly of, of focal adhesions. So it, it's, it's great to see that um, this particular enzyme is involved in all these processes. So to investigate it further, starting with 2D um, cultures uh, that I have, but obviously bear in mind this is 2D. I just wanted to see what um, migration looks like in these cells. And firstly, in 2D, and you can see here, this is a cell line called U251, which is a so-called established cell line. So not a cell line that I mentioned earlier, which is a patient derived, um, but this is the best, very first sort of step that we do in our studies, just to see what these cells are doing. And you can see here how well they migrate. So we can see how they push out these very elaborate um, sort of migration fronts and these kind of frizzly bits on the front. These are the actin enriched sort of regions of the cells. So they have a, a very nice push and pull sort of movement there. But if we add then our drug, which is our inhibitor, I hope in time you can see that these cells will stop moving and they just really become immobilized. And it's not because the cells are dying, because when you withdraw the drug, they will resume. It is because these cells really are immobilized. So we are targeting one, two or three of our key players here uh, and really getting the, the cells stuck to, to their to their surroundings and that's quite striking. So so these sort of first effects are very um, interesting, promising, exciting, but of course we need to follow them up further. And I just wanted to really um, follow this up by immunofluorescence. Um, and this is again 2D, bear that in mind. But I just labeled up um, these three key players of cell migration, which are the focal adhesions, the actin, and the microtubules. And under untreated, you can see what these cells look like when we label them with different labels fluorescently and then treat it. And I hope you can see, especially with the um, focal adhesions, I can maybe show you the pointer here. Here we've got um, these. Um, um, focal adhesions dotted around all over the cell, whereas when you treat them, they become very punctate, very localized. And um, so the pattern has definitely shifted. The same with the actin. So we've got this very elaborate um, actin rich front of the cells. But um, when you treat them, the, the actin becomes relocalized and we see these very heavy um, stress fibers all across the cell. And with the microtubules, um, we have this very strong, um, visibly um, sort of their microtubule network, which completely disappears when we treat ourselves with these particular inhibitors. So that's all very promising. But as we noted before, it might not be so relevant because we're looking here at, at cultures that are in 2D. So therefore, I have now for a long time adapted um, my my tissue culturing to 3D culturing um, because I'm particularly interested in cell migration invasion. And what I do is um, I take um, my cells, which could either be a patient-derived cell lines. So we've tested it in all kinds of different patient-derived cell lines, which are these stem cell-like cells that we mentioned earlier, or my, my um, established cell lines. Um, we take cell suspension of these. Uh, we add them to a particular plate. This is a 96 volt plate, which is called low adherence because they are coated in such a way that our cells cannot um, sort of attach to the bottom or to the plastic of, of these plates. So basically, these cells will be um, sort of getting to the bottom of the well, as you can see here in this step two. And then they will sort of come together in a sense and they start growing into spheroids. And 
this was happened probably over 72 hours. Um, everything I've tested so, so far has sort of made very nice spheroids um, in 72 hours. And these are, in a sense, mini tumors. And that is my model to start off with, I use. So I take the um, spheroids and then I embed them in a matrix which is based on collagen. And what this really does is to give the um, spheroids and the um, invading cells something to migrate or invade into. So very similar to what there would be in the brain. And I can then follow microscopically the, the invasion of, of these cells into the, into the matrix over time. And we can assess this by, by um, fixing and staining these um, collagen plugs main, containing the spheroids after uh, you know, the completion of the experiments that we have. And you can see here, then we can label them up for immunofluorescence. And this is just an actin, a dye that's taken up by the cells. And you can see all these sort of strings or protrusions emanating away from the original spheroid. These are all migrating cancer cells. And here we have just added another dye, which is a duppy dye, which means um, these cells are all viable. So I like this setup because here at least I'm, I'm a step closer um, to, to sort of test uh, anything that I'm interested in, in particular in terms of, of drug development in a 3D system, which is more representative definitely than our 2D system that we had. And this is, of course, the case for, for these um, patient-derived cell lines that I, I mentioned to you earlier, which are these ones that we maintain in a stem cell-like um, state. And it's just an example for one of them that we use. And you can see here, this is the control where we haven't treated at all. And over time, again, we see these very extensive protrusions away from the original tumor and here the dye to show that the cells are viable. But if we then add our drugs, here's a drug one and two, so lithium chloride we have used here, which also targets GSK3, or our bioindorubin, we can then see that there is a very um, reduced migration or migratory pattern. And this is indicative um, for um, the effect of the drugs. So you can see that these protrusions we see here are very short and stumpy and, and less so um, than in the control. And we see sort of different effects. So and for the bind ribbon, for example, we do see some protrusions, but not as many as in the, um, in the controls. So this is my uh, setup that I started off with, and it worked really well. I was able to screen um, 400 drugs that I was inter interested in in a relatively quick time um, to whittle down to eight also anti-migratory drugs that I've taken forward for further studies. But what are my challenges now? I, I, I've talked about, about this really nice in vitro model, but you will say what you've told us about all these different challenges. And yes, they're here as well. First of all, what we haven't touched upon so far is um, processing of data generated in 3D. Because here, the images I showed you just now were um, sort of images generated in a one focal plane. But we have a three-dimensional structure. How can I assess objectively and, and correctly drug activity if I have just one snapshot here? Because uh, we are missing all the rest of this 3D structure. So that was my first challenge. The second was obviously ECM complexity, the microenvironment again that these cells find themselves in. So what, what do I do about that? And what is the biological and clinical relevance of all this? So for looking at um, processing data, um, we then decided we wanted to go into that further. Um, and as we just heard, our 3D experimental setting can definite recapitulate tumor conditions quite faithfully, but we need to be able to analyze this. We need to be able to say with certainty, oh, this is the effect we are seeing. So we really need to develop a reliable system for data analysis. And as you can see here, um, what we can generate are actually um, um, stacks or confocal um, confocally based um, microscopic stacks of these images. This is just one of our spheroids that we stained uh, for, for immunofluorescence and then uh, looked at it with um, microscopy, confocal microscopy, where we can generate different layers all the way through this particular specimen, which we potentially could back, back, put back to better again. Um, similarly, we have also prepared our uh, spheroids and invading cells, as you can see here, um, for immunostochemistry. And we again sort of obtain from that some stacks or slices all the way through, which we potentially could back, to, back together again. Um, and this is just to show your um, original tumor pathology for these particular cells um, 
verified by our pathologist to say that what we generated with our sprays is actually quite sort of resembling um, of, of the original tumor. So that's great. So we decided we wanted to have some kind of tool that we can use to actually put these sections or slices or stacks that we, we generated back together and analyze. And we came up with this Cloud Buster and we were funded for this work um, by the IBIM. And this was done by my colleagues, Dr. Arndt Roberger, Dr. Sabine Knipp and myself. And Arndt is the programmer for this um, and had to come up with a fantastic workflow where we were able to use our um, data, um, our imaging data, and that was scanned and transformed. And by doing so, uh, it was actually put back together again into single 3D pound point cloud structures. So that's after data extraction. And then um, Ant developed a combined automated um, morphological analysis. So the kind of features that we were interested in or phenotypes we were interested to inter interrogate. And, and that means that we could take these stacks we generated, put them into this um, and into these um, single 3D point cloud structures, um, then recreate a, a 3D image of the original image, and then we're able to, to do some computational evaluation from here. Um, we also want to continue with this uh, by introducing machine learning. This is our next step, but uh, at the moment um, we are um, relying on the software to actually do the analysis in this sense. And what you can see here is um, an example how we can use Cloudbuster. Um, in our case, we were interested in the extension length or the protrusion length of these spheroids, um, the distance from the spheroids. So uh, for this particular single cells that you would find in the surrounding um, in sort of neighborhood of the spheroid and single cells in the surrounding matrix. So what you can see here is just one section of an example of a spheroid where we see the original um, spheroid in the matrix and all these little labeled dots are actually the single cells escaping. But we obviously had a whole stack of these, so it's probably about 50 or so, and they were then fed into Cloudbuster and they were then used to reproduce this image. And you can actually rotate this around. We can't do this here, um, obviously, but um, if you use Cloudbuster, that's what you can do. And you will see we get much more information than just by one, um, one image or one focal plane image. So we can see the original um, spheroid itself and then here are all the different cells that have actually migrated into the surrounding tissue. And by doing so, we can then analyze um, uh, our effects, for example, of drugs. So that's what we did here. So we had some drugs or inhibitors that we are interested in, lotronculin A, CCG, 1423, and ribbon. And we were just interested to see whether we can um, actually spot differences in the effects of these drugs uh, using Cloudbuster. And these are the reconstructions here that Cloudbuster did for our spheroids with the different drugs. And here's just some parameters. Um, so for example, these average points distance to sphere. So that means um, the, the diff, diff, um, distances of uh, individual cells to the original spheroid, um, whether they're fragmented or not. That means if they're single cells or if there's some protrusions and obviously then the, the um, lengths, et cetera. And just by eyeballing these graphs, you can see there are clear differences to the control and between also the drugs. So we're very happy with this kind of development of this software. It has been also used now by, by our students and uh, PhD students in the lab, and, and it's a very promising tool. It's also freely available. If you if you Google Cloudbuster, you should be able to access this for free and use it. If you do use this, please let me know and see how you're getting on with it. Um, currently, Ant is working on expanding the permission parameters that we can use um, that we can use it for so so bear in mind that there might be some new developments and a new paper appearing so I use Cloudbuster, for example, when I did some knockdowns. I did statement knockdowns of certain genes that I, I feel like are involved in cell migration and, and invasion in, in these brain tumors. So NT stands for non-target control. And these are my, my genes that are interested in AGAP29 and AGAP12 with opposing effects on cell migration. So when I knock down AGAP29 in my cancer cells, um, I expect cells to migrate uh, less. And we can see here um, the surface of the spheroid does look different to the controls. We have um, reduced cell migration and also the way the cells look when they actually migrate away from the original spheroids look very different. Whereas my ARGAP12 um, knockdown, which uh, the knockdown would lead to an, an increased or enhanced cell migration, um, 
we can see that we have indeed some more protrusions or extensions from the retinal spheroids leading or sort of moving away into the surrounding tissue. So I was really happy to see this um, in, in, in action. And we then did some analysis here, for example, for two different cell lines, U87 and U251, which are established cell lines so far, where I introduced these knockdowns. And we can see clearly differences in, in how long these protrusions are that I've I've observed or how many there are. And this has been highly informative and it's actually going to feature in an upcom hopefully upcoming um, publication on this work, um, which I have just prepared for, for publication and it should be submitted soon. But you can see here that we, we are very um, pleased to have this software tool because it allows Neonaut to do analysis in 3D, which we couldn't to our mind do before. Now, the ECM effect on GBM migration. Now, this is all work done by um, Kaylee, um, who is a PhD student in the lab under the supervision of Alan Smith. And we're going to come to that in a minute as well. But do you remember we said that um, the ECM or the microenvironment of, of these brain tumors is very important? And we wanted just to um, investigate this um, here in our little setups that we had. And Jay, um, Kaylee did a, a fantastic job. So, so first of all, she, she did some what we call scratch assays, where we um, have monolayers of cells and we introduce a wound and we're allowing cells to migrate back into the wound. They will do that and we watch them over time. And then you can um, investigate the various drugs by adding the drugs to the whole setup. And obviously um, the less uh, sort of closed a wound is, the more a drug has an effect on your cell migration. And as you recognize here, these are drugs that we used before, rosin and CCG, and also in combination. And according to this scenario, there is actually no effect of the drugs on these cells. So we can't see any kind of effect at all. Also, when, and when Kaylee took these spheroids and, and just planted them onto a 2D surface, no effects of the drugs whatsoever. So there was no effect. So if you were gonna screen these cells, um, and, and for the drugs and just based around these results from 2D, you might say, oh, these, cells, these drugs have no clinically, uh, clinical applicability at all. However, when then Kaylee took the spheroids and actually planted them on these polycarbonate nanofibers, that means these um, are plates that are um, prepared in such a way that they have um, fibers aligned in parallel, which sort of mimic these neuron tracks I was talking about. And we added our spheroids to these um, plates. You can see that suddenly there is an effect with at least between uh, two drugs here. And also in, in, in comparison to, I think, the controls. So suddenly maybe they're actually promoting cell migration or this particular environment promotes cell migration um, when, when, when the cells are treated with the drugs. And Otherwise, um, we could then also look at the spheroid migration assays that we do into collagen gels. And here we see with the same drugs, the opposite effect. So we're actually having a, an, an, an um, anti-migratory effect with the drugs in comparison to controls in this 3D environment. So we have to be really careful when we choose the right kind of scenario to test potential drugs. Um, and I think um, Kaylee's shown this really quite nicely here and, and the relevance of the um, environment that um, these particular cells find themselves in. So we have to take that into account. So we decided we wanted to actually um, have some kind of yeah, ongoing evolution of this um, GBM model complexity. So we decided, obviously, 2D wound healing assays are not probably the best way forward because they are 2D and, and the cells are not in 3D structures. Um, we have these um, uh, tracks, these neuronal tracks or, uh, or plates mimicking these neuronal tracks, which I think are better because we know uh, that this is a cue that, that um, cells follow, brain tumor cells follow in the brain. We have our spheroid invasion assay. Uh, I believe that is a good model and um, because we have the 3D structure, we have migration into the um, um, sort of mimicked brain tumor environment. But what we then wanted to see is, can we actually engineer tracks in, in, in a sort of 3D way? So can we actually 3D bioengineer these migratory tracks? And this was the idea that we, we came up with with Alan and, and Jay, um, Kaylee and um, Jessica Senior, who was actually the driving force behind this kind of work, where we actually have um, salativous ECM tracks and uh, surrounded by a non salativous shell, which allows the cells to migrate along the tracks and just proves that maybe the cells 
will exactly do that. And we wanted to engineer sort of the 3D bioprint, this sort of environment, as you can see here. So we have our spheroid in the middle that we can implant into this environment. And then we have our tracts that they hopefully or potentially would follow encased in a non cellar CFIS shell. And this is also looking at my um, agar knockdowns that I mentioned earlier. So, so we just set this um, um, experiment up here again to show that, um, yes, there are differences between our knockdowns and the control. So agar 29, a very distinctive sort of reduced migration into the matrix. Um, the cells stay very close to the original spheroids, um, whereas you can see this massive invasion um, with the other knockdown. And we can look more closely um, by confocal microscopy at actually the edge or the rim of these spheroids to see what's going on here and what the morphologies are because we have um, observed morphological changes. And we can also do then um, a, another condition here attached to this by, by using our anti-migratory drugs. So this is our normal um, scenario and our confocal microscopy and looks very promising. But then going back to our 3D GBM migratory drugs, um, this is what... Um, Jessica then engineered. She, ma she managed to, to do, do this uh, bioprinting of these tracts. And here you can see the control um, U87 spheroid implanted into this tract. And lo and behold, over the time that we've looked at these, you can see how these cells will follow these tracts. They do not deviate um, outside the tracts, they will follow these cues. When you can look more closely, we can actually look a little bit more at the morphology. Again, we see these protrusions and these single cells that eventually sort of lop off the original um, protrusions and tumors. And just to show that they actually do not deviate here, this is our control in, in non-cell adhesive agarose, and we do not see, sorry, we do not see any cell migration whatsoever. So we are very happy with this uh, um, um, setup and scenario, and that we can actually mimic here these neuronal tracts. And then Jessica did this again then by conformal microscopy, and uh, we see a very similar phenotype to what we've seen before with our knockdowns. Again, here, these kind of very closely associated cells in, in the in the archive 29 knockdowns and here this massive expansion of cells away from, from the original spheres and the other knockdown. And interestingly, we just added also our drug combination that we've been investigating, and this seems to really um, inhibit cell migration in, in, in normal cells and, and non-target control cells, but it also seems to have an effect very much so on this um, knockdown where we have seen this very in sort of invasive potential of these cells, and this is greatly reduced here. And by doing this, we see that they actually will follow also tracks, and by doing so, we can then look much more closely at the morphology and the structure of these spheroids um, at the edges to see what is actually going on with the cells. So we think we have already mimicked some kind of um, uh, um, external cue that these cells would find themselves in their real environments. So this is the development of this 3D model, um, but what Jessica has been doing um, with this is that she actually hand produced the, um, this, these sort of models um, using 3D and, and she, she was able to characterize our guided cell migration here. Uh, as you see, the combinations of cell adhesive and non-cell adhesive poly biopolymers, and that's great. Um, and it, for, to start off with, this was a fantastic experiment and it works. But as you can imagine, and because it, this was hand produced, it's quite laborious in, in the sense that if you had to um, yeah, produce more of these to actually do some drug screens, etc. So we looked at some other ways to maybe produce this. And here comes um, the 3D bioprinting technology that we would like to use, which is SLAM. And this was actually described and, and um, first published by, by um, Jessica, which is suspended layer additive manufacturing, um, where we can actually um, make layers of these um, suspensions that we want to use and they they will solidify once the print is completed um, and the benefits obviously are that this is at least semi-automated and we can create very complex structures and you can also allow a higher throughput and as you can see here this was the initial sort of study that Jess did uh, that we can actually um, also now deposit spheres onto these collagen tracts. And the way it works really is here, as you can see, that we have um, a, a fluid gel print bed that we create um, and by, by cooling a hot agarose solution. Um, and then um, we actually then 
at our bio inks um, that, that are produced by careful selection of hydrogels and cells. And we mix them before, yes, adding them to the bioprinter cartridges. And, and this bio ink is then extruded um, because we have a self-healing fluid bed and, and these multiple cartridges we can also use to extrude different hydrogel layers. And um, we can then create a multi-layered construct really. So, so we're allowing here to be uh, some very complex um, configurations to be made. And then once um, cross-linking cross takes place um, and in combination with the sound media, we get solid solidification and, and that provides this metabolizer success there to the to some scaffold and we can then release um, uh, actually the construct from the supporting fluid gel and um, allowing us to make a very um, intricate sort of micro environment for our brain tumors. And here's a sort of first sort of attempts of that as well. Um, you can see again how these spheroids embedded into these uh, constructs are migrating very proficiently away from from the original spheroid. And these will allow us to really investigate um, the effects of drugs on cell migration. And as you can see here, this is also based around some previous studies we've done um, um, in, in um, our recent research um, with a PhD student of mine, Sophie Ketchen, where we um, looked at combinations of drugs and, and really observed these very striking phenotypes. We also did some live cell imaging here now then with this model that, that um, um, uh, Jessica developed. So these, um, for example, non-target control, again, U87 spheroids moving along these tracks and filmed by um, um, light sheet microscopy. This is in collaboration with um, colleagues from the University of Birmingham. And now we can look actually in, in sort of in action at the cell movement of these cells away from the original spheroids. So again, this would be very interesting in terms of drug development and design um, to look at the effect of drugs in this kind of setup. And um, just to show you in comparison, our drug combination we also used, you can see that cells have tried to sort of migrate away from the original swear rates, but they're very rounded and then stop migrating. So I think these are very nice models that we can use to actually look at dynamics and interactions um, between cells and their environments, uh, hopefully then replacing what we might have to do or would want to not want to do in in vitro in mice. So I think in vivo in mice. So I think this is a very nice scenario setup that we can now follow up further. And finally, um, now um, um, Kaylee, our PhD student, I've mentioned earlier, she has now started to bioprint these tracks. And you can see here where she has implanted, again, a spheroid onto these tracks. And we can do now um, high throughput analysis of, of you know, um, drug screens um, and that we, we maybe propose or looking at um, and the, the intricates of cell migration and invasion of these spheroids along these tracks. So this is ongoing work. And, and I want to thank um, Kaylee for sharing me, for sharing this work with me and, and you here today. So finally, now, um, what we are intending to do is we would really like to um, um, create a more complex brain tumor model. As you can see here, this is what we envisage to do next in our 3D bioprinting um, uh, setup. So we would like to in introduce um, sort of um, parts of the microenvironment, including neurons and microglia um, and also astrocytes. We obviously want to include our salative tracts and then embed our um, or spheroids into this environment and hopefully giving this the best kind of scenario that there is to mimic what's happening in the brain. And I've actually talked to John Greenman, um, the uh, chap I was talking about earlier with the microfluidics and asked him whether he actually could incorporate this kind of scenario into his setup. And he did say yes. So I hope once we establish this um, 3D printed mi micro environment, we could then um, collaborate with John on this particular part where we can then actually expose this environment also to, to um, a sort of a constant flow of um, um, fluids that we're interested in. And I think that will actually complete the picture. I think that would really give you a really good um, indication of, of responses to drugs or, or you know, changes in the environment, which potentially I think will mimic what's going on in the brain. So finally, um, 
how clinically applicable is this or how biologically relevant is this? Um, so, so what we did here is um, we actually went back to some archival in vivo experiments and, and looked at MRI scans from mouse experiments. So what you can see here is actually um, a, a, a um, brain tumor. And this was reconstructed by Cloudbuster. And we got really excited about it. I um, we discussed this with Aunt and Sabine and said, well, can we actually use scans and reconstruct tumors from these MRI scans? And as you can see, here we can. And obviously, by doing so, we are able to, to then look at um, the different parameters that we're interested in and, and sort of assess um, yeah, activity within these tumors, at least. And... Um, Hopefully, by doing so, we then can relate to what we see in, 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 in spheroids. And that's exactly what we did. So we had um, our spheroids here, um, which uh, was a agap knockdown, or we looked at the different agap knockdowns, and we had archival um, data from mouse models and mouse MRI scans where we reconstructed the tumors. And we looked at um, parameters here, um, the, in this case, the average length of extensions. And I hope you can see that um, in the tumors, we see that there is um, definitely um, the greatest increase in average length in the AGAP-12 knockdown and AGAP-29. Not necessarily so, um, but that is very similar to the control. Unfortunately, this um, sort of difference is not significantly different because the, the sample number was very small. However, in the equivalent spheroids with the same knockdown, we can definitely see a difference between the control and the AGAP-12 um, knockdown spheroids um, in terms of their extensions. And this looks very similar to what we see in vivo. So I hope this is um, evidence for us to continue here and to expand um, our studies into looking at archival um, scans from animal models um, or animal experiments and tally them to their um, um, sort of equivalent spheroid models that, that potentially are there. Or um, my idea is to maybe even get scans from, from patients and see whether we can create um, spheroids from these patients, from tissues that are still there and see whether what we see in, in vitro is very much so what we also see in patients. So that's my, my main goal in, um, at the moment, that I can actually compare the two. But I think this um, got me really excited to say, well, actually, what's happening there looks very similar to, to what's happening in, in vitro. So and I hope we can really follow that to our follow up to our advantage. Um, so this is just a summary of these comparative studies. You see, we've done our statistical analysis. And as we can see, um, there is definitely a difference between the left extensions and, and these different uh, spheroids, the two with the knockdowns, especially the AGAP-12 knockdown and the control. And that's sort of mirrored in these MRI scans. So that is really promising. So and finally, um, I would like to actually come to the last part of this talk, um, and this is all work that had been uh, financed by, by Kat Herman and the um, Berliner um, yeah, Tierschutzbund, um, and I'm really, really grateful because we got a little bit stuck with this work um, because we ran out of time um, with this project. So basically, what we wanted to look at here is to actually replace the collagen because our collagen that we use in the lab, even though this is an in vitro model, is still derived from animals. It comes from rat tails. And we wanted to see, well, is there anything we can use um, to actually replace the collagen with some synthetic sort of um, matrix? And we firstly found a company called um, um, Manchester Biogel. And unfortunately, this has now apparently gone bust. So we can't get these reagents anymore. But um, this was work generated by my uh, PhD student, Sally Pryor, who had won a frame award for this. And she compared um, our experiments when we set them up in collagen and in this particular gel called alpha-4. And as you can see, um, we do get um, spheroids embedded again into this kind of matrix, but we do not see many protrusions or our migration is actually greatly reduced in comparison to what we see in collagen. And she was still able to do some cloudbuster analysis. And um, even though those results looked quite, um, I think, promising in terms of that they actually um, very, are very similar where we would see a result. Our, our problem was that um, the cells seemed not to be able to migrate so well into this matrix. 
topics. So we wanted to really investigate another company. And this is where um, obviously Kat and um, her funds came in really handy because we were able to do just that. And we're just um, um, sort of wrapping this all up, but I can show you already some results. So where we looked at uh, one experiment um, with um, U251, this um, established cell line I've mentioned to you before, and this is just one of many um, where we compared a migration into the uh, matrix over time. And I hope you can see that with this new gel, which is synthetic hydrogel in, co in comparison to its collagen, um, is doing really well. So we don't see any differences um, in, in contrast to the um, Manchester by gel that we uh, looked at before. So we're really excited about that because hopefully, sorry, um, we are able to, to replace our collagen, which comes from Mateus with this synthetic um, gel. And also in terms of morphology, um, we do not see any differences in comparison to collagen. So we can see U251 is not a very, um, um, yes, invasive in a sense, um, saline. So you do see the appendages as expected sort of appearing within 24 hours and then sort of expanding into the matrix over 48 and 72 hours. And you can see here, these are the protrusions we can see. And um, in comparison to a, a combination drug treatment that we, we are pursuing, there is no migration whatsoever. But this sort of phenotype that we can see in, in the collagen um, is also now very much so seen in this scenario, in this new um, um, new matrix that we are using. So we're really happy about this and hopefully we can put all this work together, um, um, you know, Sally's work and this follow on work that was done by my other PhD student, Pippa, um, to, to, to put into a publication because I think this would be fantastic if we could actually follow these synthetics and matrices um, up in, instead of, of using collagen. So that's, uh, that is really coming to the end of my, my talk. Um, I just really want to give some acknowledgements here. Of course, there's a lot of people involved, but um, in particular, um, Jessica Senior, who is um, really a risk hit on the 3D bio bioprinting front, and um, Alan Smith, who is in charge of the whole group. And um, we have collaborated extensively, which is fantastic. And here, Kaylee, um, who's the PhD student who's done this sterling work. My own PhD student, Sally, she's absolutely amazing in the lab. She has um, presented at conferences already, and she's done um, this work for Frame. And I'm really proud of her. Pippa here, um, who has finished now her PhD, has gone off to Brown University as a postdoc, who's done all the work for, for um, Kat Herman and, and the funds that we did. And obviously, Aunt and Sabina, um, Sabina and Aunt, um, who have done all the Cloudbuster work. So I, I'm really grateful to these these people. Our collaborators in um, in Birmingham, Steve, Thomas, Amanda Dalby, and Hal Correa. And of course, I want to also acknowledge our Fund. Um, I, I really am so grateful for having the opportunity to do this work. I think it's a very important vital work. And here we have a 3D Biomed that funded us in some way or another, IBIN, obviously Frame, and obviously Kat Herman. And thank you so much for the opportunity.